For the first time, Le Couturier revolutionizes the insular world of perfume by creating in 1921 her own fragrance, the first of its kind. Coco Chanel seeks, in her own words, a woman's perfume with a woman's scent. Her scent should be as important as her style of dress. A woman, she says, should wear perfume wherever she would like to be kissed. For the first time, number five defies the conventions of perfume which glorify single flower fragrances. Coco Chanel calls upon Ernest Beau, perfumer to the Tsars. In search of inspiration, Ernest Beau ventures as far as the Arctic Circle, finding his muse in the exhilarating air issuing from the northern lakes under the midnight sun. The couturier encourages him to be ever more audacious, demanding still more jasmine, the most precious of essences. May rose, Haitian vetiver, ylang ylang, sandalwood, orange blossom, essence of neroli, Brazilian tonka beans. He composes a bouquet of over 80 cents for her. An abstract, mysterious perfume radiating an extravagant floral richness. For the first time, number five transforms the alchemy of scent through Ernest Beau's innovative use of aldehydes, synthetic components which exalt perfume like lemon, which accentuates the taste of strawberry. Aldehydes add layers of complexity, making number five ever more mysterious and impossible to decipher. For the first time, number five, a code, an identification number, makes the sentimental names for the perfumes of the day seem instantly out of date. It receives its name because Mademoiselle Chanel prefers the fifth sample Ernest will present to her. According to some, she also chooses the number five because of its magical, luck-giving qualities. For the first time, a perfume is presented in a simple laboratory flagon, pure, austere, as bare as a vial. The minimal lines of the number five bottle distinguishes it from the mannered bottles of the 20s. Its sobriety ensures its timelessness. By some accounts, its stopper, cut like a diamond, is inspired by the geometry of the Place Vendôme. The original bottle adapts imperceptibly to its time. Number five becomes an icon of the 20th century. In 59, it is honored by the MoMA of New York, and Andy Warhol depicts it in a series of silk screen. For the first time, at the liberation of Paris, American GIs flock to the Chanel boutique on the Rue Cambon, lining up to bring bottles of number five to wives and fiancés waiting at home. From the United States to Japan, the fragrance's fame spreads. It soon becomes the best-selling perfume in the world. For the first time, number five pioneers a new form of advertising in the world of fragrance. In 1937, Mademoiselle Chanel herself is photographed at the Ritz for Harper's Bazaar. For the first time, a fragrance is advertised at the Super Bowl finals. Number five enjoys dizzying success. For the first time, number five's place in history is secured when Marilyn Monroe, at the height of her stardom in 1952, reveals that she wears to bed just a few drops of number five. So I'm Chanel number five. For the first time, Jacques Ellu, artistic director of Chanel between 1965 and 2007, features celebrities as incarnations of the iconic perfume. In 1968, Catherine Deneuve agrees to lend her French beauty to number five, followed by Candice Bergen, Susie Parker, Ali McGraw, Lauren Hutton, Carole Bouquet, Estelle Warren, Nicole Kidman, Audrey Tautou. For the first time in the history of number five, a man agrees to represent the most feminine of fragrances, Brad Pitt. For the first time, a perfume created in 1921 is still the best-selling and most famous fragrance in the world. Number five resists the whims of fashion and the passage of time, as if Mademoiselle Chanel had found the formula for the feminine eternal.